as our MC said, I am indeed Fiona Lander, and I am a doctor and a lawyer, which my grandparents think is just the best thing ever, and uh, my friends think is pathologically insane, uh, <laughs> as I'm sure you probably agree. Um, I want to talk to you today about the links between health and law and why I work in the field I work in. But I also want to talk to you about how I got here. And, well, one thing that really bugs me and something that I think might bug you as well, given where you're at in school, that big question, what do you want to do with your life? What are you going to be? Are any of you starting to get really annoyed by this, Year 12s? Yes, put up your hands, absolutely. Good, I can keep talking. <laughs> um, I really struggled with this question as a secondary student. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but you know, I knew what some of my strengths were, and I wasn't one of those people that always wanted to be a doctor, but I, I wanted to be able to make some kind of difference. I wanted to be able to do something meaningful with my life, because meaningful work is really important. So I started studying medicine. But one of the things I found as soon as I started working in the clinical context, you know, in hospitals, was that so many of my patients' problems didn't have to do with what was going on in their body. It had to do with something that we call the social determinants of health. So these are things like housing, employment, education. I still remember one patient that I found you know, really confronting to deal with because she was really struggling. She couldn't get a job. She was a single mother and for many days she had basically been feeding her child in preference to feeding herself and her diabetes was out of control. And there's no pill you can give for that. There's no pill you can give for unemployment or not having enough money in your bank account. And I found it really difficult. I gradually realised that a lot of the reasons why people are unwell in our society is because there are all of these things that cause disadvantage. And in some cases, it's laws that cause this. In some cases, it's legal problems that people experience. So, as you do, I decided I'd study law as well. Bizarre. <laughs> Bit of an unusual response. But, you know, I did. And I, I really enjoyed it because it made me realise I could be an advocate for my patients, that I could stand up for them and, you know, fight the system. It's all very idealistic, but it meant a lot to me. And during my degree, I had so many people ask me, what are you going to do? Are you going to be a doctor or a lawyer? If I had a dollar for every time anyone asked me that, I'd have at least 20 bucks. Um, <laughs> probably 60, actually, enough to buy me a number of Mikeys. Um, but anyway, I decided towards the end of my degree that I didn't need to be constrained by that question. I wanted to do something that genuinely linked the two. So, again, as you do, I moved to India. <laughs> when I graduated, instead of working as a doctor or a lawyer, I went and worked with the UN Special Rapporteur on Health. He's kind of the top independent expert in the world on the right to health. And he works all over the world investigating how the right to health is fulfilled in different countries. I went to places like Guatemala, a very small country in Central America, where the the population is made up of, say, 50% Indigenous people and 50% non-Indigenous people. And yet, in 2010, when I visited, there wasn't a single doctor in the whole country that spoke an Indigenous language. And this is not like in Australia, where we have literally hundreds of Indigenous dialects. There were three. But every doctor spoke Spanish. And I spoke to a mother whose child died because she couldn't explain to the doctor how sick he was. She couldn't explain that it wasn't just a cold, that he'd been sick for days, and he actually had meningitis. And that kind of story just cut me to the core, because that's not about the health system or, you know, the doctors working within it. It's about the overall structure of the country and this kind of systemic discrimination against people. Similarly, when I went to Syria, two months before the revolution, not before war, before war had actually broken out. Uh, I remember visiting and thinking, wow, you know, this country's got a really reasonable health system, even though essentially a developing, reasonably low-income country. 95% uh, of people had access to pretty good GPs, pretty good hospitals. The problem was, if you were part of the minority group, you didn't. There was at least 150,000 people in that country who... Uh, what we call stateless Kurds. So they were Kurdish people who weren't recognised as citizens. They didn't have ID cards, they couldn't vote, and they couldn't attend healthcare services without paying a substantial amount of money. And, you know, it was awful. I just looked at this system and went, it serves 95% of people so well, and yet there's these people that are forgotten. 
And those things really bothered me. But the thing that bothered me the most was when I got to come on mission to Australia. <laughs> and that was the most extraordinary opportunity because until then I'd never really understood how much disadvantage there is in our country. Things are pretty good, don't get me wrong. You know, on the world scale, we're, do we're doing reasonably well. But I, I was shocked, I was really shocked. We, we hear about these problems in the abstract, but you never get to see them in the concrete. I visited a number of prisons where it really hit home to me that people are incredibly disadvantaged to end up in prison. They're usually lowly educated, they often don't finish high school, often very poor, often suffering from chronic conditions. And just today in The Age, it was reported that around 40% of people in prisons have mental illness. That's not a coincidence. You know, our prisons are becoming houses for people that actually really need treatment, not imprisonment, if that makes sense. Um, as well as that, I got to visit a number of Indigenous settlements and, again, I was shocked. And, I mean, I must say, things are getting better. I don't want to be negative. Our Indigenous health indicators are improving, but not quickly enough. There's still a divide of about 10 years of life expectancy between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. It's, it's not good enough. So I decided I would come back to Australia and try and use both of my qualifications to do something meaningful, like I'd intended to do since school. And I want to talk to you today about a project that I'm working on at the moment that I think is really interesting. I think it's an idea worth sharing. I'm working with the Advocacy Health Alliance Network, which is a project that looks at co-locating medical and legal services to improve health outcomes for patients. It's such a simple idea, but it's really effective. And what it recognises is that, you know, being a doctor alone or being a social worker or being a nurse, you can't solve these patients' problems. You need to work in a team and think big and use skills from all over the place to make sure that you address these social determinants of health that I was telling you about. One great program that I work with is called the First Step Program, and that's in St Kilda. And what the First Step Program does is bring together all these different professionals, so GPs, addiction medicine specialists, mental health nurses, counsellors, but also lawyers, to assist people who are addicted to drugs and alcohol and who've decided that they want to have some rehabilitation. Um, one amazing success story they had through that was a 50-year-old lady who'd been addicted to drugs for most of her life. She'd had a terrible upbringing with a lot of abuse, which is not uncommon. And she finally went, you know what, it's time. I'm ready to kick the habit. I want to move on with my life. But the problem is a lot of people who use drugs have um, criminal offence histories, you know. They'll often commit crimes while they're under the influence of drugs. And she had a long history. But fortunately, the lawyer, together with the, the doctors and the nurses and the other people in the practice, made a great rehabilitation plan for her and they took it to the specialist mental health court and they said, you know, this woman really wants to change, she really wants a second chance. She was able to stick to her rehab plan for 12 months and now, instead of being in prison, she's at home living with her two daughters for the first time in decades. That, to me, sounds like a much, much better outcome than... Well, being in prison, that was the only alternative. And the lawyer and all of those healthcare professionals, they were the ones working together that got that solution. I'm so glad to be doing what I'm doing. It doesn't seem as though there's that many links between working as a doctor and working as a lawyer, but to be honest, there's heaps, because all of these things cause disadvantage that not only la land people up in, say, prison, but they also cause poor health, if that makes sense. And until we start addressing these things as teams, then we're not actually going to address the root causes of these problems. So I don't regret for a second studying the two degrees that I did, but one of the things I do want to share with you is that I realise now, 10 years later, that I didn't need to be a doctor or a lawyer to achieve these things. I just need to work as part of a great team and play to my own strengths. Um, there are so many amazing people that are making changes for really vulnerable populations in our society. You know, entrepreneurs developing web apps that mean that you can track your medication use and actually stick to a regime. You know, musicians that raise awareness of disadvantage and vulnerability. You know, I am really appreciative of the fact that I get to work in two such amazing professions, but I guess what I would say to you is don't be constrained by that. Don't feel like you have to put a label on yourself. Don't feel like you have to answer the question, what do I want to do with my life? 
don't feel like you have to answer the question, do you want to be a doctor or a lawyer? Because that is a crazy question. <laughs> you know, you can make a niche for yourself. And what I would really ask you to think to yourself is, who do I want to help? What do I want the meaning in my work to be? And I think that that's a much more important and interesting question. Thank you. Thank you.